Good evening. And welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Whether you're here in, in um, person in the theater or joining us through Facebook or YouTube. Before we hear from Michael Beschloss about his new book, Presidents of War, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up here next week in the McGowan Theater. On Tuesday, December 4th at noon, award-winning author Stephen Hess will tell us about his experiences working with several presidents from Eisenhower to Reagan, which he has recorded in his recent memoir, Bit Player, My Life with Presidents and Ideas. And then on Thursday, December 6th at 7, we'll look ahead to the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment and the opening of our Rightfully Hers exhibition in March 2019 with a panel discussion on women in the vote, opposition to women's equality from suffrage to the ERA. Check our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates. And you will find also find information about other National Archives programs and exhibitions. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities. And if you visit their website, archivesfoundation.org, you'll find more information about the foundation and how to become a member. And a little known secret that I keep telling everyone, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the National <laughs> Archives Foundation. <laughs> Michael Beschloss's new book, Presidents of War, tells the epic story of the American presidents who have waged our major wars from the early 19th century through the Vietnam War. A recent review in the Washington Post by Matthew Dalek calls Presidents of War a significant feat of historical synthesis and praised Beschloss as a deft researcher and a first-rate storyteller. Jay Winnick, writing in the New York Times, remarked that there are fascinating nuggets on virtually every page of Presidents of War. It is a superb and important book, superbly rendered. Michael has long been a great friend of the National Archives and serves as a vice president of the board of directors of the National Archives Foundation. He's an award-winning historian, best-selling author, and Emmy winner has been a New York Times contributing columnist. He's the NBC News presidential historian and a contributor to the PBS NewsHour. And he has the largest Twitter following of any American historian with more than 315,000 followers at last count. His account appears on Time Magazine's list of the world's top Twitter feeds. He is an alumnus of Andover and Williams College and the Harvard Business School, where he studied leadership in both the private and public sectors. He served as a historian at the Smithsonian, a resident scholar at Oxford University, and a senior fellow of the Annenberg Foundation. Michael holds six honorary degrees from several colleges and universities and has been awarded the State of Illinois Order of Lincoln, the Ambassador Book Prize, the Harry S. Truman Public Service Award, the Founders Award of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, the New York State Archives Award, and the Rutgers University Living History Award. In addition to his work with the National Archives Foundation, he's a trustee of the White House Historical Association and former trustee of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Another longtime friend and supporter of the archives is Cokie Roberts. Cokie is a political commentator for ABC News and NPR. In her more than 50 years in broadcasting, she's won countless awards, including three, three Emmys. She was inducted into the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame and cited by the American Women in Radio and Television as one of the 50 greatest women in the history of broadcasting. She and her husband, Steve, write a weekly column syndicated in newspapers around the country, and she has written six New York Times bestsellers, most dealing with the roles of women in U.S. history. Her best-selling books about women in American history include We Are Our Mother's Daughters, Founding Mothers, Ladies of Liberty, and Capital Dames. Koki serves on the boards of several nonprofit institutions. President George W. Bush appointed her to his Commission on Service and Civic Participation. In 2008, the Library of Congress named her a living legend, one of the very few Americans to have attained that honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael and Koki.
you can't hear, I guess you can't respond. How's that? Uh, back row, hear okay? Everyone listening at home? I guess they can't reply either. <laughs> they, thank God. Or they wherever can't you are. Um, can you, and me too? Is my, okay. Well, Michael. We, and we I, can't account for the content, only the volume of the sound. <laughs> <laughs> Michael and I love being on this stage. Uh, we have done it many times, several times with each other. Indeed. And um, often with others uh, who have written uh, something that you are interested in reading. And so it's a treat for us to be together here. And Michael has produced yet another fabulous book. It's a big book. Um, 700. In, in the nicest sense of that word. <laughs> <laughs> it's 740 pages. Uh, but it's 740 really readable pages. And, um, and interesting to get into. And it starts with the burning of our fair city. Uh, and um, it's a good place to start uh, because you're talking about the first American war after the revolution Major. and the, um, the perpetrator, in a sense, the president, had actually written the Constitution, the father of, and uh, did not believe that we should be going to war over things like this. At least in 1787, he thought that way. <laughs> and then politics happened. Right. Uh, the short version is James Madison, great founder, not great war president. Uh, this is the Cliff's Notes version of the 750-page. Uh, well, actually, uh, you, you actually found a, a, a direct quotation, if I can find it here. Um, saying from a, a newspaper, saying exactly that at the time. I mean, in real time, which is what's so interesting. An elegant scholar, but the most incompetent executive functionary that ever disgraced a nation. Uh, per per Boston perfectly Gazette. put. The Boston uh, Gazette, right. Yeah, so Madison, as a founder, helps write this constitution that says, presidents should not get us into wars on their own, should not get us into wars unless they're absolutely necessary for our security. And then the War of 1812. Uh, for instance, the way I write about it, what is the first war we lost? I don't think it was Vietnam. I think it was the War of 1812. Actually, I, argue, I uh -huh. would argue Please with do. you on this one. Uh, I know you have, have, because girls do homework, mm -hmm. uh, I've... <laughs> I've <laughs> and, and especially Koki does. I've listened to a lot of Michael's interviews about this book, which has been delightful. But he, he says, our most unpopular war was 1812, and, and it's the first war we lost. I agree it's most unpopular, and mm. we'll talk about that a little okay. bit. But I don't think we lost it. Um, and here's why I don't, I understand okay. what you, you say we had these ambitions. Koki is from New Orleans. There's <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Jackson propaganda about to be un, un, unveiled. No, uh, no, you have no. to know where she's coming from. No, it was a little bitty, I mean, think about it. America was this little bitty, tiny combination of states huddled on the Atlantic Ocean with this idea Mm -hmm. And that's what we are. We're an idea. True. And, uh, and the rest of the world thought we were crazy. And what happened as a result of that war, no, we didn't con conquer Canada. That no, was, but that was one of the two big still, wars. But still, come on. Know. What we did was survive. Anyone a, been to Canada lately? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still independent. No, so and half and, the war we didn't achieve. And the Canadians, are, the Canadians have a big deal about the War of 1812, yeah, much sure more do. than we do. But, they remember it better. But we survived. We survived as a nation with Europe recognizing us as a nation. We did. But does it meet the test of the founders of a war that was essential okay. to our national security? Right. No. The other central war aim was to get the British to stop harassing us, which they did not do. So the way I look at it is... But they finally did. It was our last war with the British. Uh, it was, but they continued to harass our right. ships, and right. No, right. the two purposes of the war were stop harassing our ships and seize Canada. And, and the other thing is that, in my view, the way I write about it, as you know, it got us into a really bad habit because what, 
what we had was at least a, mar a war of marginal necessity was a mor war of choice. And I think at least you would agree it was, I think you have said, <laughs> very unpopular. Founders thought we shouldn't get into wars that the Congress and the people did not embrace overwhelmingly. And Madison and his people spun this as this immense victory. The victory of New Orleans, Andrew Jackson. After the uh, Treaty of Ghent. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> great victory, but had nothing to do with the end of the right. war because the war had already been solved. And but still, it gave a sense to the country that we were really a country. Uh, yeah, but a war fought just to give us a nice sense what did not meet the test well, of the founders, which was... Well, if we had lost, was, it would have really been bad. I yeah, <laughs> but it would have been even better if we had not fought it at all. And, uh, and I think the problem here is that when we have wars that we should not have waged, that we at least possibly did not win, James <laughs> he's, Madison... He's tempering. Uh, he spent 11 years on this. So, uh, <laughs> It opened the way for later presidents right. to get us involved right. in wars that were even more uh, optional and not of great uh, necessity. And it also licensed later presidents to lie to Congress. Right, uh, which, which I want to talk to you a lot right. about. But, Indeed. but the truth is, not only was it unpopular, it was unpopular at the time. I mean, right. even he, at the beginning. He had to get a, it was a party line vote. Right. Dolly Madison wrote to her sister and basically said, get your husband down, he was a member of Congress, yeah. get your husband down here Absolutely. to vote for the war, otherwise he's in deep trouble with me. Right. And, um, and, and, and when you're that reduced that you need your right, wife to be right. riding her brother-in-law, that's and a problem. And in the House of Representatives at the time, there was no, uh, there was no control on debate. Right. right? The House could, if, I mean, wrap your minds around this. The House could talk forever. <laughs> and um, I mean, it was a filibuster situation. Few, fewer members. Fewer members, right, but still. So. And the way they stopped debate on the war was somebody threw, I mean, it's the most disgusting story I've ever read, threw a spittoon. And it made a clatter, and God only knows what came out of it. Mm. And, um, <laughs> and it stopped the conversation for a minute, and they chair gaveled and said the Congress, you know, speech is over, call a vote. And it was a straight party line vote. Right. Straight party line and vote. And not exactly vote. what the founders wanted. They wanted, you know, vast majority in Congress, vast majority of the American people. And by the time this war was over, 1812, New England almost seceded right. from the Union the because they were convention. so angry. Right. And so it is connected. I mean, the first scene I have in the book is <laughs> Uh, for dark forest of northern Virginia, and it's raining. And the president of the United States, James Madison, is on his galloping horse, running away because the British, as they are burning the White House and the Capitol, there are also a lot of them would, would like to capture Madison and Dolly and hang them as battle trophies. Well, first they ate her meal. Right, they <laughs> ate her meal after they had escaped from the White House. Right. So in a way, I look at this as sort of divine punishment for breaking the lock on what you go to war over and what you don't, because Madison, whom I love as a founder, I love Dolly, Koki and I share this in common, <laughs> but of all people, he was the right. one who opened he the way for He actually wrote these words and right. then... And, and then, then didn't, didn't honor them once right. he was president. Right. But he did... Well, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, one of the things you do talk about, though, is how each of these presidents of these eight wars that you write about, and Michael doesn't go to our most recent wars because we don't have enough history. Right. And um, Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, my view, and Koki and I have discussed this, I know we agree, is that you need about 30 or 40 years until you can get documents opened by the National Archives, especially security classified ones and get people around a president to speak a little bit more candidly. Sometimes that takes even longer. Yeah. But the they other thing is die, that- They need to die, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> since this is being live streamed, I don't want to say something like, it might get, get us in trouble. It might <laughs> sound like a wish rather than a, <laughs> a comment. We wouldn't feel that way about any president's no, entourage. No, no. Uh, but the other thing that's even more important is hindsight because right. You know, you need at least 30 or 40 years to know how the story turns out. At least. Yep. 
and sometimes a lot longer. Right. Uh, and we, we can talk about that a little bit. Right. But, but I brought up Dolly not only because I love her, but because one of your themes in this book is that each of these presidents of the eight wars that you're doing, and this is, we're talking 1812, um, Mexican Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, right? Um, one of your themes is that each of these presidents has a very strong wife. Yeah, of, of different kinds, but they really did, and made them better presidents. Uh, one example I love is Eleanor Roosevelt, who told FDR after Pearl Harbor when he was being urged to intern the Japanese Americans, don't do it. And he abruptly signed that fatal order. And she was shocked and horrified. And friends of hers later on observed that there was a difference in the marriage after that because Eleanor had Made her accommodation. Right. Earlier. She discovered in 1918 FDR's relationship with his, her social secretary, and she agreed to stay with him because she felt that they shared political ideals and she wanted to help. Well, after she saw her husband sign the order interning the Japanese Americans, she thought maybe they didn't even share the political ideals that she, th that she thought that he did. And people noticed that after February of 1942, Although FDR was lonely and would say to her, I come want you to me. stay home yeah. and come with me, she kept her distance and she traveled an awful lot. It made a difference that she was the first lady who was always trying to urge FDR to be his better, better self, self and did not always <laughs> succeed. Don't we all are just right. husbands right. to do that? But, yeah. but <laughs> right. right. Um, the other theme that I've noticed you talking about is how... Uh, these wartime presidents found themselves becoming more religious yes. over them, of course. And talk, talk to us about that. In, in every single case, for instance, uh, Koki knew Lady Bird Johnson extremely well for how many years? Your whole life. My whole life. And a wonderful thing for me. Amazing woman uh, who was particularly close to Koki's beloved mother. I got to know her a little bit late in life, and one of the things that she told me, you may have known this, you probably did. I didn't, did, but, but I, I heard you talk about it. Yeah, her, she so. said, you know, she said, Lyndon got more religious as the war went on. And I said, what do you mean? And from my view, and we haven't talked about this, but my view of LBJ is that, you know, he would go to church, he was disciples of Christ, and he was happy to be photographed at church, but I don't think religion was a big thing in his life except for politically, right. as we find with polit many a lot of posing, political right. leaders, a lot of posing. But she said that as the war went on, Lucy, who converted to Catholicism when she was 16, would take her to her church here in Washington, St. <laughs> Dominic's, oftentimes southwest Washington, oftentimes late at night, oftentimes the press didn't know about it, and that LBJ was racked with agony over the war and the number of kids who were dying and whether this was the right thing to do. And Lady Bird said he got great comfort from going to church with Lucy. She used to talk about my little monks. She used to talk <laughs> about going there. And Lady Bird said during that period, she said, I wouldn't have been a bit surprised if Lyndon had converted to Catholicism because it provided him with such relief. Mm. Not the same story with other presidents, but they tend to become more religious. Abraham Lincoln, as a young man in Illinois, was thought of as maybe an atheist, certainly a skeptic, maybe an agnostic, a scoffer at religion. And one of his old friends from Illinois came to see him in Washington. Everyone here, or many of you have been to Lincoln's Cottage here in Washington, the place where he spent a quarter of his presidency up the hill from here. It's been restored in the last 20 years or so. Really Wonderful cool. historic If you haven't site. been, go. Really important. <laughs> but uh, Lincoln was visited by one of his old friends, and the friend comes in and finds Lincoln, I think, in the, in the library of the cottage, reading the Bible. Bible. And the friend almost fell over. You know, re Lincoln reading the Bible. And Lincoln said, I cannot understand how someone could go through this experience of being a war president with all of these casualties and not find comfort from religion or from something else. And talked about the blood. The blood. Uh, Lincoln, who said to 
several of his friends from his youth, can you imagine that I, who could not even stand watching the sight of a chicken being slaughtered, I am responsible for making decisions that result in oceans of blood. And that's another thing. The best war presidents have empathy. Uh, empathy is an important factor in a great president. And then he asked for the burials to be around the Lincoln College. That's the thing. That's what you'd want in a president. Lincoln knew that all these people were dying, hundreds of thousands of Americans on both sides. And someone came to him and said, there are so many people dying. We need to build a new national cemetery. They, they, started, they, started, at, they started at Robert E. Lee's house. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and this was not so empathetic. He, he turned Lee's house into a cemetery. The bodies moldering in Lee's house at Arlington, basically revenge against Lee right. and to make sure that Lee's family would never return there, show Lee what the cost was of waging the struggle. But Lincoln said about the new National Cemetery, put it near my summer house because I want to see the Union graves being dug when I go Think there in the morning this. and when I go back to the White or when I, when I leave the cottage in the morning and come back in the evening because it's going to be horrible for me, intensely painful, but I want to be confronted all the time with the evidence of the results of these terrible decisions that I'm making. I never want to get too far from that. As opposed to Nixon, who said, I want to treat them like chess pieces. Right. Nixon said, I don't want to get too emotionally involved. And sometimes Nixon would meet with families of soldiers who died in Vietnam, and he would be crying by the end. Right. But Lincoln's instinct was make this as mathematical as possible. Lincoln's instinct was never in that direction. Nixon's was mathematical. Yeah, yeah. Lincoln, Lincoln, uh, Nixon's was. Right. Also, of course, the book is full of echoes. And anybody reading it, you know, is just sort of, oh my goodness, nothing changes. Which is, of course, what happens when you study and read history all right, the time. Right, as we've discussed so many right, times. Right, right. So you start with Thomas Jefferson not waging war. Now, shall we disclose the family connection? No, no, no. I mean, you know. All right, just a second. And we have to reveal this is a good thing. Tell about your family relationship with Jefferson. Oh, well, I had an ancestor who, when the 1800 election happened, he was the sole vote from Tennessee. Uh, and he had the same number of votes as all of Virginia, all of New York, and the Congress. And um, so he stuck with Jefferson through 36 ballots, even though all the writing at the time said he's young, he's vain, because he was, he was under the age of seated, being seated in the House, uh, but nobody else was running from Tennessee. And, um, and a month later, he became governor of the Mississippi Territory, and then when the Louisiana Purchase happened, they sent him to Louisiana, and we've been there ever since. But... Um, <laughs> but but, you know, it was a straight political payoff. You know, you stuck with me 36 ballots, governor. Um, but but, if, but it, if it were not for him, Jefferson would not have been there to save us from war in 1807. The, it's like go. the end of It's a Wonderful <laughs> Life, you know. <laughs> but, but even though Jefferson didn't go to war, his notions about the embargo were as wrong-headed as what... Yeah, those, those were dumb. But, 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 but before then, 1807, can I have a word on that? Yes, please. I, I'm pro-Jefferson. I, like, <laughs> I don't like the embargo, but I think it's a more important thing. How many here know about the leopard in the Chesapeake? 1807, which I tell the story That's of. interesting. It deserves more attention. Yeah, it does. There was a fight between the American ship, the Chesapeake, the British ship, the leopard, off of Norfolk. The Brits won... They conquered the American ship. It and, was bloody. And took a bunch of American... Yeah, absolutely. And Americans were sailors. justifiably outraged. They were demanding war. And Jefferson later on said, if I had been someone who loves war, all I had to do was open my hand and I could have had a war with England over this fight between the two ships. Of course, it would have been a big mistake since he had cut back the military. So. Well... <laughs> It, again, that, I, which I, I do write about. You do. But, you do. but the more important thing is that Thomas Jefferson was setting the right example, which came from the founding period, which, in which he was so important, which was only get involved in a war if it's absolutely necessary. And if Jefferson had been someone who 
wanted war, wanted glory. I mean, John Adams and James Madison, when they were thinking about becoming war presidents, they got uniforms. Mm -hmm. uh, George, they wanted the reclam that comes with being a military. I remember what George Washington got for the Whiskey Rebellion. He right. Got, right, the whole right. Thing. Adams had a gleaming silver sword, and Madison had a bicorn hat, and it gave him stature. Jefferson didn't need it. He said, let's not get involved. Which in is e e even more remarkable when you think about the fact that he was considered a coward during the revolution right. for escaping from, from, right. from Richmond. And if he had been a smaller man, in, in, not in stature, but in, in, spirit. in spirit, he would have said, well, you know, war is a way of uh, raising my poll numbers. <laughs> we do find this later on in American history. Right. <laughs> much too much as I write about but, it. But, but, but then what he did instead of war was the embargo. Yes. And, and it, he said it'll hurt them more than us. Wrong. Right. <laughs> this keeps happening. Uh, it does. Yeah. Uh, and another place. We, we have no idea what happened in American history after the year 1974. So <laughs> this, this is not about current events. But we lived. We did. <laughs> but, and then the things, I mean, there are many echoes we'll, we'll talk about in terms of going to war with a lie. Right. But, um, Happens but a lot. things that, that I hadn't really thought about until I read your book uh, Polk being called by the Congress because the opposite party wins in the midterms and he is subpoenaed. Right, as he Lots should have Lots of been. subpoenas are handed I think out. presidents should be able to be subpoenaed. Right, and, and he Polk invokes... is one who, who gives that. And he invokes executive privilege. Absolutely. And that's the first we've heard of that. Yeah, and the problem is that uh, Polk was a liar and a bully and a scoundrel. No, I know you don't like him. I uh, didn't... <laughs> uh, and, and a slaveholder. See, she, she's also from Tennessee, so she's no, trying no, to defend I her. I kind of book. like Sarah. She was, she was the cat. Sarah, Sarah's fine. <laughs> we have a lot of presents where we like the first lady yeah, that's and are not wild about the and president. The, and the public does, too. That's true. Right, so. um, Which books do better, the first ladies or the presidents? <laughs> Actually, I know some secrets about that that are oh. really neat. But, but the fakes, that's another huge theme in your book. Right. Um, you know, the raid on the Texas border with Polk and the Mexican War, Remember the Maine with the right. Spanish-American War, the Gulf of Tonkin. Right. You know, so... Um, In fact, can I say is, a word on that please, one? Please, I don't want to skip over all this. No, uh, I want you to say a word about all that's, of them. That's a big theme here, which is that too many of our presidents have gotten us into wars that really were not necessary and did it by fake military incidents that they fabricated or misinterpreted. Uh, Polk sent Zachary Taylor's soldiers to Texas hoping to provoke the Mexicans to attack us at the border, which right. they did. And Polk then lied to his Secretary of State, lied to Congress, said we need a big war against Mexico all the way down to Mexico, Mexico City, City in revenge for this little skirmish that was a few dozen people. What he really wanted... Which they had provoked. Which they those, had provoked. Those few dozen people. Absolutely. I mean, our, our team. As I write about. <laughs> I'm sorry to report, fellow Americans. Uh, but what Polk really wanted and would not tell anyone was he wanted to get about nearly a million square miles of right. territory from Mexico. All the way to California. Make this a continental nation, a worthy aim but did it in a lying and dishonest and almost And while way. he's doing this, he is making deals with the British about Oregon. Right. So that he can do this. Right. So he's, it's clearly in his, there's no, in his I'm, mind, it's completely clear. Yeah, and, and I'm all, you know, you're looking at leaders are always ends versus means. His ends were mainly a good thing, although his aim was for those nearly a million square miles of new territory to be slave territory, which I do not honor right. Pope for, not. obviously. Right. Uh, but the other thing is that he got us even more in the habit of it's okay for a president to lie us into a war. McKinley, you mentioned, uh, the sinking of the Maine. McKinley said, we need to do this largely out of revenge against the Spanish for the sinking of the Maine. Only one problem, if you look at it historically, the Maine was sunk not by the Spanish, but by a boiler accident. <laughs> and you can't go to war against boilers, so he wanted a war against Spain. 
And that again said another president, and then Lyndon Johnson, whom you also knew, I did not, in 1964, we have the advantage that we didn't have with these other presidents is these tapes that LBJ made right. of his private conversations. See, Michael has which listened are here to 700 hours of Lyndon Johnson tapes. You want to do an imitation? Uh, <laughs> an unprovoked attack uh, <laughs> is what he called the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964. If you're really uh, imitating Johnson on these tapes, there's a lot of profanity which cannot be uttered in the National Archives, at least by a live historian, although the tapes might be played. But you hear the tapes of uh, that day in August of 1964. Robert McNamara calls Johnson, says we've got a report of a possible attack in the Gulf of Tonkin later that day, and we've got these wonderful, you know, can't do better than tapes, where McNamara calls up Johnson and says, well, we're still not sure if it was an attack or not, but now it's been leaked to the AP. And Johnson is running against Barry Goldwater and cannot afford to look weak. So that night, that's the night he goes on TV and says there's been this unprovoked attack against Americans in the Gulf of Tonkin, the first big bombing of North Vietnam by America that begins the rock slide to Vietnam goes to Congress, gets a resolution from almost unanimously both houses of Congress to use armed force against or in Asia in response to this attack. And Johnson and Nixon for the next nine years fight the, the war in Vietnam Knowing. based not on a war declaration but based on this resolution, although in private Johnson discovered, as I write a couple weeks later, that there was never any such attack. So not only is this not a war declaration, but it's a resolution based on an attack that never took place. Now, as an aside, we'll come back to the main theme, but because you brought up McNamara, the tapes get him too. Uh, I see Robert <laughs> McNamara as one of the great villains in American history. I don't know, we've talked about no. this, but, and, and for this reason. Uh, and this, this is enough decades later that I, I feel pretty strongly about this. Couple reasons. Uh, McNamara wrote a book in the mid 1990s that we have read, uh, both of us and maybe some of you, in which he says, "We are all to blame for Vietnam." Well, we're not all to blame. I was seven years old. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't seven. But, but you were not. You were not Lyndon Johnson's Secretary of Defense. No. And McNamara sort of shows all the forces that led Johnson into Vietnam, except for really himself. What he did not realize was that LBJ had taped so many of their private conversations, tapes which were opened after this book came out, and a big truthful correction to history, because what the tapes show is that McNamara, through 64 and 65 and 66, when Johnson had been on the fence on Vietnam, McNamara is the one who says, you must proceed with this war. If you don't do it, we're gonna lose the Cold War. If you don't do it, you will be betraying President Kennedy's memory. Because uh, Kennedy was Because Kennedy would have done this, and I can tell you because I was Kennedy's Secretary of Defense. So the point is that not only was McNamara a huge influence on Johnson who respected McNamara very much and would, would have probably gone in whatever direction McNamara led him, to, led him to, but then later on wrote a book basically renouncing a lot of the responsibility that he had. So Until the tapes. Until the tapes. <laughs> and so that's what I mean by a villain. Another, another aside I want to go to before I come back to this question of, of lying to Congress and going to Congress, um, the role of the press. The Spanish-American War. Yes. Um, I mean, this was, by the time the Maine was hit, or what exploded, right. um, the, the yellow press had been trying to get us to war forever. Sure. And the president needed to respond. Fel right. Fel and felt he needed to felt respond. Felt he needed to respond, and McNam uh, McNamara, <laughs> McKinley knew that there was not an overwhelming reason to go to war against Spain but he was basically weak and he deferred to Congress and also he knew that 
the yellow press, largely in New York, but it affected a lot of the rest of the country. There were wire services. Had whipped a lot of Americans up into a fever against, over, the, Sp against the Spanish over Cuba and over the name, thinking that this was the Spanish who had sunk it. And so the result but is it, it would have main, taken... They were already they were already going after the Spanish. Absolutely. Because of American investments in Cuba. Sure. Sound familiar? Yeah, sure does. <laughs> yeah. But it would have taken someone of Jeffersonian stature to stand up and say, no, that does not describe McKinley, mm -hmm. sadly. So then you, you, you have these examples of people lying to the public and to the Congress, but you have many more who didn't even go to the Congress. Right. Which is um, even worse. And that was, of course, back to the Constitution, that right. the notion that one man couldn't wage war. and that, The founders that, knew that the way that kings in Europe, especially England, operated was if they get to be unpopular, they develop a fake reason for a war, and everyone suddenly loves the king and is united. <laughs> they wanted to make sure the presence of the United States would not do that. That's the reason that anyone who reads the Constitution, Constitution says that wars are declared by Congress, not presidents. But when was the last time we had a declaration of war by Congress? 1942. Have we had any major who wars since 1942? Who was the one vote against it? Jeanette Rankin. And <laughs> note her gender. Uh, and note in 1916, as long as we're jumping around, uh, any members of the Woodrow Wilson Anti-Defamation League here? No Wilson descendants? Don't, don't start with me. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a huge no, Wilson fan, no, nor is Cokie. No, no. In 1916, Wilson narrowly won re-election because of California, and more specifically, the votes of women in California. They were Anyone? allowed to vote in some Western right. states before 1920. Yeah, it just wasn't guaranteed. What was Wilson's re-election slogan in 1916? He kept us out of war. Total lie. He had been at war actually with Mexico, so it wasn't even true. But uh, a slogan like that Which was just suggest... revived. Pancho Villa was just right. invoked at the right. border. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> what is old is new again. Right. Uh, but, but if you have a slogan like that, it sort of tends to promise, if you will reelect me, you won't have war either. <laughs> and these wonderful women in California who made the difference in that state and made the difference in the whole election, they voted for Wilson because they were taken in by this phony slogan. They were idealistic. They didn't want war. And the slogan convinced them that Wilson was the way to keep out of war when privately he knew it was overwhelmingly was likely way. that he was right. on his way. Well, FDR did some of that too. I mean, uh, I will not. The boys will not go to war. That with you. Right, right. But, um, but then you had Abraham Lincoln, Indeed. who we both agree is a hero in many pieces. Indeed. But, um, and, but and with some big exceptions, a model war president from my point of view. Right. Um, but he didn't go to Congress. Well, he didn't go to Congress for, for an a very reason. good reason, right. which was. He said, this is not a foreign war. The Confederacy is not a foreign country. If I were to ask Congress what was left of it, because the South had gone, but if I were to ask Congress for a war declaration, that would be to concede that this is, another country. That this is a different country. So and he, he, did he, not. he made it more like the Whiskey Rebellion. Yes, that this is a, an insurrection that I'm putting down in the same way that George Washington did in Western Pennsylvania. But then there was a president you like a lot, Harry Truman. Uh, it may be amazing to you that there was any president that I like a lot. <laughs> and he didn't go to Congress for Korea. I love Harry Truman, but not for what he did in the summer of 1950, which was North Koreans invade the South. Truman sends MacArthur to South Korea. I'm with him so far. Sends the armed forces. I'm with him still. And then his aides go to him and say, when, Mr. President, will you be going to Congress for your war declaration? And Truman says, I'm not going to do it. James Polk told Congress to go to hell, and I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> I mean, for me, even invoking Polk in a positive way, <laughs> you know, my love for Truman is ebbing quickly. Uh, and the reason was, again, this is going to sound a little current to you. Right. 
He said, I don't want to go to Congress to ask for a war declaration because if I do, I'm going to be involved in a big, long debate, which might be embarrassing and damaging to me. And, and five months from now, this is June of 1950, I've got to deal with midterm elections. Right. So for the most low political reasons, Harry Truman, who was not plain speaking in this case, uh, does not go to Congress. And these things all set precedents right. because 14 years later, Gulf of Tonkin happens. Johnson's aides say to him, when are you going to Congress for your war declaration? Johnson says, Truman didn't go for a war declaration. I don't have to either. So That's goes the Polk, goes direct, direct so line. So Polk infects the presidency, <laughs> and infects is really the right word. But I have to say, again, and I, I understand the presidents didn't go, but as somebody who spent a lot of time with Congress as opposed to indeed, presidents, indeed. they didn't want the presidents coming. They don't want this responsibility. They don't, and that's the problem. Because that is exactly the since problem. Since 1942, we've had some major wars. And presidents, well, Truman never went to Congress even for a resolution. Shame on him. But Johnson at least went for a resolution, even if it was based on a fake incident, and he lied about it for the next five years. Uh, George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush went to Congress at least for resolutions to use force. And actually, the resolution, the Persian Gulf War with H.W. Bush yes. uh, debate was one of the most profound debates that I've totally agree. ever heard in Congress. Totally agree. And they really didn't want to have it. They really didn't want to have that responsibility. The mem but and unfortunately... They, and then they finally did. And one of the reasons it was such an uplifting debate uh -huh. was because there were still World War II vets there. Yes. And, and they um, knew what was at stake. They knew. It was and they remembered the way it should be done. Right. The problem is, I, I'm defending a president and saying it's a, it's a mistake to go to Congress only for a resolution because Persian Gulf War ended in six weeks and it was actually designed to end quickly. So it did not last so long to get unpopular. Had it lasted 17 years, it would have been unpopular. Right. Uh, George W. Bush went to Congress for resolutions before Afghanistan and Iraq. Problem here is if it's just a resolution. Which we're war, still operating under. Still operating under. If it's a resolution and the war becomes unpopular, you then have members of Congress, I will not mention any names, <laughs> who say, I had no idea the president was going to use this resolution right. to wage a real war. I was only talking about use of, uh, use of force. Mm -hmm. And so you're not helping a president by doing this because you know, to have Weasley members of Congress claiming they had no idea that there was a war coming. What the, what the founders wanted, and I'm totally with the founders on this, right. they wanted Congress there on the takeoff. They wanted founders there on the crash landing if there was one. And the reason why presidents don't get support from Congress or can't claim it is because members of Congress can, in a dishonest way, claim that they had no idea this was going to be a war. Because they don't want it, they don't want the responsibility. Well, and therefore, if they voted for, if you're voting for a war declaration, it's pretty hard for a member of Congress to say, I had no idea this was going to end in war. Right. Pretty clear. And if it means that we have fewer wars because members of Congress will not vote for a war declaration, well, maybe we should have fewer wars. But it, that's not what our experience has been. Uh, it has not been, but the reason why presidents since 1942 don't ask for a, de a declaration is because they think the Congress might not support what they're after. You also talk about, and very beautifully, about a presidents waging war well versus those who don't. Mm. And your view is that um, a president who brings a moral compass to the war uh, is one who can wage the war well. We're America. And, Presidents have to be moral leaders, and especially in wartime. And you start with Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And you say the first year he wasn't so much. Now, he was, he was having a lot of political difficulties. He, sure. He was trying to keep Kentucky and Maryland and Absolutely. Delaware in the Union. And, and was dealing with radical Republicans. Right. And, but, but at that point, he's also just trying to keep those border states that haven't left. Right. 
So he's not talking about slavery. No, certainly not. And, and then he does. And, and if you read his speeches, not only is slavery barely mentioned, but he talks about it as if he's almost litigating a document. He says at one point, if I can have slavery and right. keep the union, uh, right. that's fine. If I can not have slavery and keep the union, that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And he's trying to pretend that you know, he does not have any particular views about slavery. But the thing is that after the first year, year and a half, uh, it's impossible for him to keep on walking on that tightrope. And he begins talking about the war as a moral struggle. And you know, I've said it before, I, I think of it as the moment in The Wizard of Oz where it goes from black and white to color. Lincoln begins really talking about what is in his heart. And you, you think that you're really listening to Lincoln now, not this tortured person trying to pretend that he's just waging this war for well, political But that reasons. was brilliant, though. It was brilliant the way he handled it, because he could have lost those states. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But the point is that ultimately he understood right. that because this is America, this has to be a moral crusade. And once he began talking about it as a, war, a moral crusade, he was a more effective commander in chief. Union soldiers felt that they were dying for something larger than you know, just you know, fulfilling the, the legal clauses of the Constitution. European company, countries would not support the Confederacy. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Right. And Lincoln said, I now realize that if I go down in history, I will go down in history not just as a successful commander in chief, but as the liberator of a race. And that's so American that you have a president acting right. as a moral leader. And if you advance the clock to Franklin Roosevelt right. in 1940, Roosevelt was thinking, you know, do we get involved in a war against Hitler and maybe the Imperial Japanese or not? You know, thank God, guess what book he happened to be reading? Carl Sandburg's Lincoln, Lincoln the War President. Huh. You know, it's almost like, you know, right. you can't make fate. this stuff up. Fate. And, the great hand of fate. Uh, as an Illinoisan, you know, I love Lincoln. I love Sandberg. It's not the most literally accurate book uh. on earth, but <laughs> as long as FDR was reading about Lincoln, fine. that's fine with me. <laughs> and the, the point that Lincoln is making is that Lincoln was a moral leader. And I really believe that had, that had an influence on, on Roosevelt because you get to January of 1941. And Roosevelt is giving his State of the Union, a phrase he invented. Mm -hmm. He was the one who caused those, what used to be called the annual message, message. is now called the State of the Union. And what does Roosevelt talk about as he's on the verge right. of taking America into war against Japan? A war that and America Germany. was not happy He's still happy on about. the fence about. But he I mean, begins they had, talking about... They, they voted by one vote for the draft at that same point. Right. Uh, right. He did. Right. But he talks about, it. if it happens, it's going to be a moral struggle for the four freedoms, right. not just some war for the balance of power in Europe. And the biggest obstacle that Roosevelt had in 1941 was the president that Koki and I love so much, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson, who had not only a rank racist of the first order. And anti-women. Anti-women also. <laughs> Uh, was the, the biggest obstacle to suffrage. Absolutely. And at the same time, a president who wanted us to, at the end of World War I, to get involved in a League of Nations with him so far. And then in one of the biggest examples of political malpractice, leaves the United States for months because he's the only one who can negotiate the treaty at Paris. This is not a modest person. A friend of mine, a Wilson scholar who likes him more than I do, <laughs> read my Wilson chapters, and in the margins of one of these pages of mine, he wrote, would you at least consider deleting the words conceited and messianic? So that's, <laughs> a, a, that's, that's sort of my direction on Wilson. But because of Wilson's malpractice, we did not go into the League of Nations, led to the Became rise of Adolf more Hitler, I'm led to the advent of World War II, the biggest millstone that Franklin Roosevelt had in 1941, trying to convince Americans desperately to get involved in this war for the survival of freedom, for our survival, was that Americans said, Why we remembered we be, Woodrow right. Wilson. He got us into an unnecessary war, Which killed, killed 116,000 Americans. We are dead set against ever doing that again. <clears throat> it's a miracle that FDR was able to overcome the legacy of Wilson. So. 
Well, Pearl I do Harbor. Not, I do not honor Woodrow Pearl Wilson. Harbor made a big difference. Helped. Right. Yeah. But at the same time that those are the two men that you hold up as the moral presidents. You know, Lincoln and Roosevelt, Lincoln with and Roosevelt. gargantuan exceptions like right. the internment of the Japanese right. Americans. The civil liberties. I wrote a whole book saying that I thought that Roosevelt did not do enough about the Holocaust. And and habeas corpus in, yes. in, in the Lincoln's Civil War. Case. Yes. So the, the, what we're saying here, which you know better than most, presidents are complicated people. They are complicated people. <laughs> and they thought that these things were necessary to do to win. One thing that Harry Truman said that I think all of us historians should always remember, Koki and I sure do, is he said, any damn high school kid with 2020 hindsight can make better decisions than a president operating at the time with <laughs> fragmentary information. Well, I'd quote the other wonderful Harry Truman thing, though, because Which this is I an love. audience uh, with perfect for it. Truman always said, not every reader will be a leader, but every leader has to be a reader. Yeah. Uh, I think we can all clap for that. Truman used to say, I can't understand anyone, and I'm only quoting Truman, he said, I can't understand how anyone who wants to be president could not be someone who reads books and could not be someone who reads history. Because in Truman's case, it's this wonderful, wonderful story. Grew up in Independence, Missouri, thick glasses. The parents said, we can't replace them, we're too poor, so no contact sports. And so Truman said, as a result, instead, I read every book in the Independence Public Library, which I always thought was an exaggeration, but anyone been to Independence? It's not a very <laughs> it's big not library. A big library. Right. But the book that Truman loved, and I apologize to Koki and all of us feminists here. 1895, it's a 1895, great 1895, a book called, apologize for the title. No, it's a great book. Great Men and Famous Women. <laughs> the premise that women could not aspire to be great, only famous, subtitle, from Nebuchadnezzar to Sarah Bernhardt, so <laughs> covered a wide swath of human experience. But Truman would say, when I had to make these tough decisions, and who had to make more of them? You know, firing MacArthur, whether right. you use atomic weapons, atomic respond weapons, to the right. Russians in Europe, uh, do you integrate the military? Truman said, I never found a president who had exactly the problems I did, but when I had a tough one, I'd remember something that Abraham Lincoln did or Andrew Jackson did, it would give him comfort. President Kennedy on the eve of the Cuban Missile Crisis, fortunately for us all, read Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. The lesson of that book, big wars Fine. can happen because of miscalculation right. or error or miscommunication. What better lesson to be in Kennedy's mind as he began the missile crisis? So, one of my metrics for a great president and a great war president is, is this someone who knows history and uses it well? A lot of them don't. So we're going to turn it over to you in a minute. Uh, I have one last question for Michael, and then Michael has something special he wants to say. Um, but my last question is about um, process. Because, again, a lot of people here are learning their histories, writing histories, all of that. This book took you 10 years. Um, and one of the things that I noticed uh, was how much you used newspapers. And one of the things you and I have talked about is how easy it is now to have access to newspapers. They're online from the 18th yeah, century on. Yeah. And, and so you not only can sort of read in real time what's going on, but you see every ad, so you oh, understand. Oh, it's incredible. Right? So you know what the society is doing yeah. and all of that. And, and it's how, a much huge, you, it, how much it's did you It's a huge them? source now. Uh, I started doing this when I was 21 years old. My first book came out when I was 24. And I worked in the archives. I worked in the Library of Congress. You'd get out this microfilm, and you'd start winding it. <laughs> And, uh, I'm actually still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, decades have passed. Right. Uh, and they've also air conditioned the Library Thank of Congress, right. which is a big right. change right. from right. those days. But the thing is that, as Koki and I have talked a lot about, you can use these search engines and it's you fabulous. can find articles from 1807 about episodes that you're writing about that 
as hard as the two of us might have worked on those microfilm machines, we wouldn't have found this stuff. No. And you can write history in a really new way. So it makes it a lot more exciting. And it's not quite the equivalent of discovering 700 hours of LBJ's private <laughs> conversations, but, it, but it's, it's almost up there. Well, and uh, speaking of that, because I should give you the opportunity to tell that story, um, in those 700 hours, you learned something very, very important about Johnson and the war and General Westmoreland. Right. A uh, number of things, but maybe the, to, to end at least this part of our talk with a happy story, and when talking about LBJ in Vietnam, that's quite a feat. <laughs> uh, but in January of 1968, LBJ got a request from his commander in Vietnam, William Westmoreland, who said, we're facing defeat in Vietnam. Why don't we move tactical nuclear weapons to South Vietnam? Tactical nuclear weapons. And use weapons. them, if necessary, to avert a defeat. Any president who tells you leave war to the generals should not be president. <laughs> and LBJ had the wisdom and judgment not to be taken in by that. And a few recent documents have given us the final pieces in the puzzle, and also Tom Johnson, whom we both knew, who was a young man who really just spoke for the first time about this in recent times. Uh, Tom Johnson took this from being something we knew, which was a general making a request and getting a response from the White House, you know, the White House being a building replying. Right. <laughs> uh, Tom Johnson shows us what the president inside the White House, how he really responded. And LBJ saw this request and stream of profanity, because this doesn't exactly differentiate it from Johnson's response to anything else, but, <laughs> but maybe a particularly intense stream of profanity. And Johnson says, you know, nuclear weapons in Vietnam, I've been spending four years trying to keep this war from going nuclear. Don't they understand that could kill 100 million people? Russia and China could come into this war? Absolutely not. Lock up the documents. I don't want someone in the Pentagon leaking a document saying Westmoreland had a way of winning the war, and Johnson turned him down. And thank God for that. And if anyone ever wants an example of does it matter who was president, you could have had a president in operation in 1968 who was mouthing that stupid platitude, leave the war to the generals. If Johnson had done that, many um, of us might not even no be alive. Somebody just had no experience. Somebody yes. who was inexperienced. Absolutely. Right. And that gets back to what you were saying earlier about history does require time. It does. And this is 50 years. We haven't really known that since 1968. And I think mainly one of the reviews of my book said that I look at LBJ in Vietnam with frustrated sympathy I think that sort of describes it. I, it's but, the way I feel about it, too. Yeah. But here's a moment in which he really did commit right. a good deed. Now, one thing I'd like to say before we go to, to other questions from the floor here, and if you have any, we've got microphones, I think, on both sides. Yes, we do. But if I could take a moment, is Nancy Smith here? Yes. She's right there. Uh, Nancy, you have to stand up, please. <laughs> Uh, Nancy, <laughs> uh, that, that counts as standing up. Nancy, uh, one of my earliest experiences with the National Archives was in around it was this time of year. It was Christmas time, 1977. I was researching my first book at the Lyndon B. Johnson Library, and the archivist I was working with was Nancy Smith, who's right here. <laughs> but even better, we can give her applause. <laughs> She's had a, a glorious career since then that deserves it, and this, this incident I'm talking about with me is probably the least of it. But I was doing research for my first book, and at the same time I said to Nancy, you know, when I was seven, I wrote a letter to President Johnson advising him to <laughs> hire a large carving firm to carve President Kennedy's head on Mount Rush Rushmore. <laughs> and, I got a reply from Juanita Roberts, LBJ's secretary, which I still have, but I don't, I wasn't at the time in the, in the habit of keeping Xeroxes of my letters going out. <laughs> so is there any chance you might be able to find this in a, you know, maybe there's a big barrel of kids' mail or something at the end of that. And within five minutes, Nancy comes to me, here's your letter. <laughs> uh, and 
if there was anything that showed me at a very early age what the National Archives and what great archivists were capable of, that was it. So could we have a hand for the National Archives? And, you and my, my great friend, David Ferriero, uh, the great archivist of the United States, could we have a hand for him too? We have, we have never had a better archivist of the United States in the True. history of the National Archives. True. And I'm sort of sure, I'm amazed that we're capable of writing history, American history, all the way back. Only one third of that time has there been a National Archives. That's right. It's, it's a relatively new right. institution. 1930s. Right. But um, Michael has been trying to advise presidents ever since he wrote that letter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with, with, with no success, as you can see. <laughs> we'll be delighted to take your questions for a while. We'll start here, and we're good to just alternate. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, just talk a little closer into the mic. Thank you very you much. Um, it's an excellent read, and it's um, not, um, even though it may be seemingly a lot of pages, they're very well, well written and it's very true. clear very and, and, and very insightful. I was struck in reading the book uh, after each segment of history that you talked about the president's, your commentary, which is relatively brief uh, with your analysis and, and, and statement. But the one piece that I would quibble with you on sure. uh, would be your quote with regarding- Koki Coke, has warmed things up on right, that. Right, right, right. <laughs> with respect to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, you say that by the 21st century, some Americans would think the wartime president uh, wartime Roosevelt, primarily in terms of the mistakes that led to the, war, the Pearl Harbor disaster, the removal of Japanese Americans, and other infringements of civil liberties, the failure all, to... All, all of which I really am very critical of, I hope you'll mention. Correct. And, and I would say that, that that was why it was surprising reading what comes next, because the <laughs> chapter is very well written about his failures. Um, the failure to significantly improve the lot of African Americans and to do more to thwart the Holocaust. You then go on and quote the New York Times, which said, men will thank God on their knees 100 years from now that Franklin Roosevelt was the White House. You say, it is difficult to imagine any other American leader of that generation guiding with such success a resistant nation toward an invention and ultimate victory in this most momentous of history's wars, as well as taking Americans into a post-war assembly that would strive to enforce the peace. I think of Kimmel. I think of what happens with Kimmel as the, as the commandant in Pearl Harbor, how he's thrown under the bus, how the breaking sure of the is. Japanese code, which you quite aptly described. All of which I go into some length in and, 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 and the fact that the fact that really it begins with the embargo of Japan following the invasion of Manchuria. This was not a, obviously a president that had already thrown his lot towards the British as much as he could, as you described with the Lend-Lease sure. um, and all the Churchill's entreaties to him. And I'm struck by what happens in his decision to run for re-election in 44, how feeble he was in Yalta, what happens in Yalta, what the, the, goes we need forward. To, we need to let other people get the, qu the, qu the question is, support your, your, your conclusion the last piece I would add there, which is most striking to me, is Churchill's entreaty to bomb okay. the railroads there, in Hungary. Is there a question? Yes, no. the, the, to bomb the railroads in Hungary to stop the slaughter of the Jews in, in Hungary. Which I, which I wrote a whole book on called right. The Conquerors, where so, I was very so, hard on Roosevelt. So you're that. critical of almost everybody else in the book, mm -hmm. yet you, after all of that exposition, you somewhat laud FDR. Yeah, in light I, of I, that... I do somewhat laud him, and the main reason is, despite all these gargantuan mistakes and failures, which, as you say, I devote a lot of space to, and I mention also in that assessment of, of FDR, we have to remember how difficult it was for FDR to get Americans to accept not war after Pearl Har Harbor, we were attacked. The real decision was to get Americans in Congress to rearm in 1939 no, and 1940 know. and 1941. My, a lesser politician could not have done that. You know, John Nance Garner, right. Al Smith I love, right. he couldn't have done that, right. Alf Landon. So that's what I'm saying. We were lucky that we had Roosevelt there because of that, because if that had not happened, 
we would not have been in, in a position to help the British to survive and the whole, war, the whole, the whole world could have been the lost. the whole lead up with Lynn Lease and all of sure. that. I mean, my, my parents talk about it. My, my, at that point, my father had been elected to Congress at age 26 right. in 1940. Mama was 24. And they were virulently anti-war, right? right? The kids. And, um, and, and for very good reasons. Right. And he was in a hearing they on They remembered Lindley. World War One. And Well, they were born in World War I. But, but right? no, but they, they remembered what right, had happened. Right, yeah. and, and he was at a hearing on Lynn Lease and called her up and said, you've got to get up here. You will not understand what's happening if you don't come to this hearing. Right. And it's a much longer, funnier story, but the, um, but the truth is that, that Roosevelt put that all in place so that by the time of Pearl Harbor, the... the Groundwork had been laid. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, before, hi. I, hi. Before I ask my question, I just want to jump back to a place in, in uh, with Jefferson in Paris in France when they were doing the Constitution. He said, "How do you get all the states to be motivated to work?" Now, with that as the background, <laughs> every time there's was a president, <laughs> and there were a lot of wars, what were the incidents that motivated? Congress, the people, the president, to change their direction and declare a war and fight a war. This, that, that, you know, what you were describing is sort of the aftermath and what the philosophy is, but every war had this incident right. that got us involved. Can you go through? Sure. Well, we've talked uh, about most of them, but, and, and I think, yes, I mean, Pearl Harbor, eliminated most of the remaining isolationists. They realized that this was a struggle we had to get involved in. All I'm saying is that presidents should not come up with fake incidents to get Americans to accept a war that they otherwise wouldn't. Right. And the other problem, which we haven't touched on, is presidents abuse power during wars. Right. FDR right. did. Right. Woodrow Wilson passed something called the Espionage Act, right. which is still in force, which enables a president to harass journalists, it's happening today. He's, they're using it today, um, no, they're using it today. Yes, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Abraham Lincoln declared martial law in, these, in, in modern times. And there was nothing in the Constitution about martial law. Absolutely. So if you're, if you're worried about a president abusing power in modern times, war is one way that presidents Can abuse precedent. power. So what I'm worried about and I'm not talking about current events. This is a book that I started 11 years ago. But what I'm worried about is that when you have the combination of a president knowing that he can fabricate an incident that may get Americans to accept a war, and knowing that wars allow presidents to become much more powerful oftentimes than they were in peacetime, that is a danger that the founders worried about, but we have to deal with now. This guy Lincoln had Fort Sumter to motivate people to getting sure. us into the Absolutely. war. This guy uh, Wilson had uh, right. a, a, shoot, a, a sinking of an American ship that got us motivated. You're, you're uh, making my Rosa point. Rosa had <laughs> Pearl Harbor. We all I mean, agree. These are you. incidents. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Great point. Right. Over here. Yes. Uh, regarding your comment about the unpopularity of the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding was it was unpopular in uh, New England at the outset. But it was also my understanding that the Federalist Party, which opposed the War of 1812, largely disappeared mm -hmm. after that in, in large part because Well, they of, had a couple of elections where they did pretty right. well at right. that point. Well, maybe, and that's what I'm going to ask is, for, so my understanding, which might well be wrong, was, it, it, was the Federalist Party disappeared after the War of 1812 largely because they had opposed a war which became popular. It's my sure, understanding no, that, wrong. that sure was one of the reasons. But, but during the war, they had a midterm. Yes. <laughs> um, These where they mid did, midterms keep on right, invading our which, Where they brains. did quite well. Uh -huh. and, um, and then uh, when there was a split in the Republican Party where a group ran, was running DeWitt Clinton against Madison and the Federalists decided to, su to sign on with them. Mm -hmm. And so that they would try to, you know, combine to oust Madison with Clinton. And even though Madison did very well in the electoral vote, the popular vote was quite close. Right. Um, and in fact, 
who was it that wrote later in the century that Dolly Madison saved the presidency of her husband? That without her, it was James G. Blaine. James G. Blaine wrote that without that, Dolly. That, that noted historian. Right. That without Dolly Madison, DeWitt Clinton would have been president. Right. <laughs> and, and, and after 1815, the, uh, the opposition to the Federalists said, you know, this is what they did wrong, and this was a great glorious victory. And that's why they had a big investment in making that seem a successful See, this is where he and possible. I disagree about whether it was a right. win. <laughs> We're going to have an arm wrestle at the end of this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the, your speech, everything. Appearance. Oh, well, thank you for and being here. For, for the moderator and, and just even for, from archive. My name is Li Yang. Uh, I think you both have some disagreements, so I am more enthusiastic to ask uh, what do you agree about and what do you don't, and whether you can judge some kind of credibility from your document you try to search as a historian, and whether which part or, or period in the history have more credibility, and whether you can say something like a Twin Tower event and uh, or some of Bin Laden's death, and then John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, or MLK? Well, I think, uh, and I hope this, this responds to what you're thinking of, one reason I'm so worried about these fake incidents that get Americans into wars that may not have been all that necessary, it's like crying wolf. Mm -hmm. When presidents <laughs> develop a reputation for lying and arousing Americans about incidents that didn't happen or didn't happen the way they said, the problem is that then, when there really is an incident that deserves the American people responding by saying, let's support a war, they might not be there the next time. But tell the story of taking your children to 9-11. Yeah, uh, which we've talked about. When I first went to Ground Zero in New York, uh, my wife is here somewhere. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, there she is. Uh, <laughs> We both took our kids to New York, you'll remember this, and to show them where the attack of 9-11 took place. And we had the indignity of having to, to, have, having to hear a group of people yelling with, in earshot of our kids, 9-11 was an inside job. Isn't and that our awful? kids were about six and eight, and they were saying, what does an inside job mean, and what are they saying, and this why so are they... Awful. So I had to explain to my kids that, you know, what was going on here. And I am not excusing people who have that view because that view is crazy and subversive. But there are people who will say, you know, Pope had the fake incident with the Mexicans and McKinley concocted the sinking of the Maine that wasn't really by Spain. And maybe FDR, maybe LBJ was looking for a war with Vietnam that he could only get with a fake incident in the Gulf of Tonkin, and this winds up being a national security danger to our country because the next time a president has to go to Congress and go to the people and say, here is something that's happened that really does deserve our support for sending young Americans into harm's way, they people, don't believe pe people may not be there. Right. Right. Anyway, thank you very much. Over here. Hi. Yes. Hi, thanks. Um, I was really struck by your observation that morality is an indication of, you know, of, of greatness Leadership. in a war president. I, I still cling to that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Go I was for wondering, it. <laughs> I was wondering if that's a uniquely American. It's very uh, American. And the okay. second that morality is taken out of our politics right. or our national security, we are not American anymore. We're not the same country. In my view. So there were... And you know, today, today the Senate voted to try to get us out of Yemen because of the horrendous humanitarian problems going on there. Mm -hmm. And so, with any luck, they will um, they will follow this through. Is, this is deep in our DNA. It is. It is deep in our DNA. So, no president has gone to Congress for a declaration of war since World War II. Can Not you since '42. Right. Can you envision a scenario where a president will choose or be forced to do that again, or do you think that balance of power has shifted too much at this point? Well, I think they are so much in the habit of not doing it that it's going to be a brave president who says, I'd like to restore this tradition, 
and I just love to have a big debate that's bruising right. and difficult. <laughs> and, but uh, they kind of want it both ways. I mean, yeah, they, they want the support, but they don't want to have to make right. a big effort. And the other and problem, Congress wants it both ways too. Congress wants to you know, say, yes, I'm voting for the resolution, and then run away the first second the, the war is uh, unpopular. I mean, excuse me for a second, Michael. Think about what happened to Hillary Clinton running against Barack Obama because she had voted for the Iraq resolution. Right, right. right. I didn't want to mention names. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but I mean, that's, that's why they don't want to vote That's on why those. they don't want to. And, and the other thing, and this is a theme that runs throughout the book that I think is really important, the best presidents of war have been those that have members of Congress, especially of their own party, screaming at them all the time. Well, give him Benjamin Franklin's great quotations. He's not my, I'm not a fan of him either, but yeah, go ahead. But you're, you're, <laughs> Franklin said, your critic is your friend. No president loves critics. LBJ had a hard time believing that right. any critic was his friend. They all hate it. But they're always better when they've got leaders of their own party in Congress saying, you're not fighting the war well enough. Koki is very familiar with the congressional leadership during LBJ on Vietnam. LBJ had a majority leader, Mike Mansfield, uh, in the Senate, who drove hated him, the war. Drove him crazy. Telling Johnson all the time, you shouldn't <laughs> be there, you're doing this wrong. The leader of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, William Fulbright. Who he called Half Bright. Half Bright, yeah. <laughs> Johnson completely hated him. I mean, one of the news stories I've got in the book is that by January of 1968, Fulbright secretly was talking to his colleagues and saying, Johnson has lied to us, members of Congress, so much about Vietnam, we should start an impeachment inquiry. That's how strongly they felt. The times we get into trouble are times when leaders of Congress feel intimidated by a president. You know, presidents have said in history, you criticize me, you criticize the troops. That's absolutely crazy. What the founders said was, the reason why our country is going to be so much better than England is that presidents will be under the lash of criticism all the time. They but didn't like it, though. They hate it. <laughs> and they should hate it. I mean, it's uh, remarkable that they passed the First Amendment. Yeah, absolutely. So criticism not only from leaders of Congress, but also criticism from the press. The times our presidents go to stray, astray, especially in wartime, is when the press is not critical enough and when Congress is not critical enough. And when they are critical, they are performing the highest act of patriotism. But it's hard to convince presidents of that. You'll never convince them. <laughs> thank you, Michael. I'm so much for looking forward to reading your book. Um, well, thank you, Regarding so Wilson, um, maybe... You're, you're about... not a Wilson relative, I hope. <laughs> no, They're I'm a critic everywhere. of his, actually. Yeah, yeah. My question will, will show that out. <laughs> um, his smallness, maybe talk a little bit about it. Um, it his racism, obviously, and his ability to affect the, the unity of the country in World War I, and also his deliberate smallness and his ability to not negotiate with Lodge for uh, right. the greater ideas. Right. Sm smallness and malpractice. And, you know, I'm with Wilson on the progressive reforms of the first term. He wrote some wonderful pieces as a political scientist but and even historian. Then he's jailing women for wanting to vote. Uh, I was just getting to that at the okay, end of the good. sentence. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do not know where this reputation comes from, and I'm glad to see him be cut down to size. Um, so Michael has books to sell, and it really is a wonderful book. Uh, it is so readable. Can, so, can, we, can we come to this last gentleman? Sure, just to, uh, John, I, 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 know I don't John want to work. interrupt these nice things that Koki is saying. <laughs> I, I hope that you'll come to say them again before we're... <laughs> John, go ahead. Yeah. I was wondering, how many of these presidents had served in the military themselves, and That's how did that question. influence their view of, of war later on? Well, you've talked about that. <laughs> not, huh? not enough. Right. Uh, and I love Dwight Eisenhower, who is not in this book because he did not bring us into a major war. And uh, the, uh, Thomas Jefferson is there, but some, someday someone should write a, a book about the heroism of presidents who kept a... Who, who did keep us out of war, did not just promise it. Well, even Adams, I mean... Yeah. You know. Adams, I wrote a, my right. last book, Presidential Courage, I right. read about the fact that I mean, Adams kept us out. But to come back to what you're saying, I think the record shows that presidents with a big military history know that. And I was talking about empathy earlier. 
one of the most poignant photographs of Dwight Eisenhower is in 1952, he was running for president. He was speaking to a military audience, I think of the Midwest, and there was a photographer. And he was talking about the men, mainly men, who died on D-Day, men and women, because of the orders he gave. And he gets so upset that he begins to cry, and you see him choking up, and he covers his face. And he finally takes a handkerchief and covers his face because he just can't he's embarrassed to be crying. And that's the kind of empathy you want. And one result of empathy is it makes a president a little less eager to be involved in a war that may bring great casualties unnecessary, unnecessarily. So if a military background brings that kind of empathy, I'm all for it. Thank you so much for bringing that right. Anyway, so now Co I'm gonna, Co Kofi was now saying gonna, the nicest things. Right, I, now I, I'm gonna I, say, I hope I didn't say, interrupt say you. Say more nice right. things about uh, Michael's book. It is not only really important to read in terms of our history and in terms of where we might go, um, but it is really fun to read. And uh, it's just uh, wonderfully written and delightful to read. It's a big book, so it's Christmas is coming. <laughs> and uh, it's a good time to give somebody a big book as a present and to take it if you get a little time off to read it. Thank you all so very, very much for coming. Thank you. Me. And could I say one thing? Yes. And Michael wants to say something more. Uh, Koki is one of my favorite people <laughs> on the planet. You see why. Uh, can we have a hand for her for oh. doing this? Thank you so much. Great.